Hello and welcome to the June 2015 Regents exam in chemistry. This is a walkthrough of part B2. This part of the exam consists of 15 free response questions from throughout the curriculum. Some of the questions are grouped together with a common narrative section. Others are standalone items. To skip to a particular question, click on the index button that appears in the upper right corner of the screen. And now here's question number 51. Determine the volume of a 2 molar hydrochloric acid solution required to completely neutralize 20 milliliters of a 1 molar sodium hydroxide solution. Very straightforward titration calculation problem. So from table T we'll bring in our titration calculating formula and then we'll transfer information from the problem directly to the formula and go ahead and solve it. We're asked to determine the volume of the acid. So that's our VA component. We are told that the concentration of the acid is 2 molar, so we'll put a 2 there. And for the base, we have 20 milliliters of 1 molar, so there's the concentration and the volume. I've taken the units out and simplified, so you can see that this is really very straightforward. 1 times 20 equals 2 times x. So our VA value is going to have to be 10. The answer to this problem is 10 milliliters. Question 52. Determine the mass of potassium nitrate that dissolves in 100 grams of water at 40 degrees Celsius to produce a saturated solution. Here we'll be referring to table G, which is the solubility curves, and we'll look up the potassium nitrate curve, and we'll track that at 40 degrees Celsius and find out exactly what a saturated solution can hold in 100 grams of water. So we bring in table G. I've highlighted the 40 degrees and the KNO3 line for you and you can see the intersection point is right there. Trace this across and read the graph. Now you're given a little bit of latitude with this because we are asked to estimate how far between the 60 and 70 we are and I would probably estimate this to be about a 64. So I'm going to go back, I'm going to write in my 64 grams and you'd be given a little bit of latitude here because again we're reading a graph and not everyone's going to see that graph exactly the same way. Question 53. State, in terms of molecular polarity, why ethanol is soluble in water. First thing we want to make sure we understand is what the polarity of these molecules actually is. Recall from your solutions unit, this is a very, very important and critical concept, the idea that like dissolves like. So if you have molecules that have similar arrangement or similar uh, orientation in terms of the polarity, they're going to have a high probability of dissolving well. So first let's analyze the water molecule. The basic shape of the water molecule is this bent molecule and it has a negative side and a positive side. It is a polar molecule because of the uneven distribution of electrons. The ethanol molecule from your organic chemistry unit consists of two carbons, five hydrogens, and one side of this structure has the hydroxyl group on it. This side of the structure is going to carry a little bit more electron activity than the other side. So ethanol really is a polar molecule as well. And here's where like dissolves like comes in. The two molecules are similar in that they are both polar. So our answer is pretty simply both molecules are polar. That is as simple as we can possibly write the answer. For questions 54 to 56, we have a narrative that will apply to all three of these questions. In this narrative, we're given three elements represented by the letters D, E, and Q. We're told they're all located in period three of the periodic table, and some of their properties are listed in the table. A student's experimental result indicates that the density of element Q is 2.10 grams per cubic centimeter at room temperature and standard pressure. And here is the data that we're provided in a lovely little table. We're going to be asked to do three things. We're going to be asked to differentiate the substances based on their properties. We're going to be asked to use periodic patterns from the periodic table to analyze them. And we're also going to be asked to calculate a percent error. So let's get started with question number 54. Question 54. Identify the physical property in the table that could be used to differentiate the samples of the three elements from each other. So we're looking for some physical property that the three elements, D, E, and Q, show some difference in. Well, first we're going to get rid of this column because 
that's an oxide formula. And they do have different oxide formulas, but that's a chemical property, not a physical property. So there are really three physical properties being described here, phase, mass, and density. You can see they're all in the same phase, and they all have the same mass, but they do all differ in terms of their densities. So the one word answer to this question is, quite simply, density. That's the physical property that you'll be able to tell them apart. Question 55. Identify the group on the periodic table to which element D belongs. So let's focus on element D. We want to identify the group. The easiest way to identify a group is to understand how many valence electrons an element has. From the oxide formula, we see that that oxide formula for element D is D2O. If you recall, the way we generated this formula was to take our oxidation states of the two elements. We know oxygen's minus 2. We're trying to figure out what D would be. And we're going to crisscross these formulas in order to get D2O. Well, you can see where the 2 came from. But the number that was used to generate the subscript on the O, since there's no subscript shown, we assume that's a 1. So our element D has an oxidation state of plus 1. Recall from your periodic table that all of the elements in group 1 have plus 1 oxidation states. So element D must be a member of group 1. So our answer, simply stated, is group 1. Question 56. Determine the percent error between the student's experimental density and the accepted density of element Q. From the narrative, we know that the student's experimental data says that the density of Q is 2.10 grams per cubic centimeters. From the data table, we see that the density of Q is stated to be 2.00 grams per cubic centimeters. So, from table T, we can see percent error is calculated as the measured value minus the accepted value. So that's going to be 2.10 minus 2.00. And we're going to divide that by the accepted value. That's the one on the chart. This is very important now. Make sure you're putting the 2.00 on the bottom, not the 2.10, because the 2.00 is the accepted tabled value. And then, of course, after doing this division problem, you multiply by 100 to get your percent. And if you do it correctly, you wind up with a 5% error. For questions 57 to 59, we're going to be looking at the narrative that's provided. The equation below represents an equilibrium system. Ah, so we're dealing with equilibriums. And we have three characters in this equilibrium system. And the reaction can be catalyzed by adding vanadium or platinum. And they've given us the equation for the equilibrium system. We'll be asked to do three things. We need to know the actual definition of chemical equilibrium. That's going to show up. We need to know how to use Le Chatelier's principle to analyze the stress on this equilibrium system. And we'll be asked to show how the catalyst affects this system using a potential energy diagram. Let's get started with number 57. Question 57. Compare the rates of the forward and reverse reactions at equilibrium. Hopefully you recall your definition of equilibrium is what we're looking for for this answer. I've written most of it out, leaving a blank here for the crucial statement. The rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. That's what makes a system an equilibrium system. Question 58. State how the equilibrium shifts when SO3 gas is removed from the system. So we're going to take some sulfur trioxide out of the system, removing it. This is a Le Chatelier's principle problem. So if we look carefully at the equation that's provided, locate where the SO3 is, right here, and if we remove some of that, we put a negative stress here, we remove particles of SO3. Well, what that does is it disables the reverse reaction from happening because we're no longer providing what's necessary for the reverse reaction. The forward reaction will continue to take place in its regular rate, but the reverse reaction is now crippled. So technically, everything's going to shift to the right. In Le Chatelier's principles, when you remove something, the system will respond by making an attempt to replace what was removed. So we're going to experience a shift to the right. The system will shift to the right. 
And question 59. A potential energy diagram for the forward reaction is shown in your answer booklet. On this diagram, draw a dashed line to show how the potential energy changes when the reaction occurs by the catalyzed pathway. Here's a what you see in your answer booklet. What you have to remember is that when a catalyst is added, it is not going to affect the starting point of your reaction. You're still going to be starting at the entry point of the reactants. It also will not affect the end point of the reaction. So our dotted line has to start right where this starts and it has to end right where this ends. So what's really different? What's different is that we don't have to go all the way up to the maximum peak of this original graph. The catalyst allows us to reach a lower height than that, let's say this point. Whatever point you choose has to be above the starting point and certainly above the end point, so it has to be somewhere above this plane. And we can connect to this point in this way. So this would be a very valid answer showing the catalyst. So the catalyst will lower the overall height of the curve. It will not affect the beginning or end of the graph. So this would be a valid answer. For questions 60 and 61, we're given the following narrative. We have two compounds. The formulas for two compounds are shown below. They are both organic compounds with six carbons in a string. I do see a distinct difference between them in that compound B has this extra little group on the end that you don't see with compound A. So we're going to be asked to understand the difference and explain it between saturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons, and also to explore the relationship of structure and properties of a compound. So we'll go in with question number 60. Question 60. Explain in terms of bonding why compound A is saturated. Well, saturated compounds in organic chemistry are compounds where the carbon atoms are connected to each other by single bonds only. So you'll see no double bonds, you'll see no triple bonds, no multiple bonds at all in the structure. So you can see in compound A all your carbons are represented with single bonds between them. So saturated compound has only single bonds between carbons period question 61 explain in terms of molecular structure why the chemical properties of compound A are different from the chemical properties of compound B the chemical properties are different because the structures are different in some way. What you have to do for this answer is point out exactly in what way they are different. You can see compound A is six carbons in a row completely surrounded by hydrogens. Compound B is six carbons in a row almost completely surrounded by hydrogens, but there is one very key difference, and if you point that out, you'll have the right answer. The regions will accept many different ways of describing this. You can point out the double bonded oxygen, or you can point out the hydroxyl group, or you can point out the whole carboxyl group that's attached here. It's a functional group. Carbon B has a functional group. And compound A does not. So that's a valid answer. There's many other ways you could say that. And final group of questions in Part B2 for 62 through 65, four questions all based on this narrative. Some isotopes of potassium are, and they list a whole bunch of different types of isotopes for potassium, the natural abundance of the atomic mass for the naturally occurring isotopes of potassium are shown in the table below. So they've isolated three particular types of potassium. Here's their natural abundance, what percentage of the total inventory is each one. And they've also given the exact atomic masses for each of these different isotopes. We're going to be asked to explore the uh, radioactive decay nature of one of these. We're going to be asked to complete a nuclear equation. We're going to be asked to do a half-life calculation and also calculate a weighted average. So uh, a lot of nuclear questions and one question from atomic structure. Let's go to question 62. Question 62. Identify the decay mode of K37. Decay modes are listed on table N, so let's go there and read it. From the selected radioisotope table N, K37, way down here at the bottom, there's the decay mode. It's a B plus or positron decay. So you can either write the word positron or the symbol uh, beta plus. I'll write positron in the blank, and I'll get full credit. Question 63. Complete the nuclear equation in your answer booklet for the decay of K40 
by writing a notation for the missing nuclide. So they've given you a nuclear equation with a blank. We don't know what the product of this is going to be. So we're going to break this down. First we'll find the top number, the mass number. Remember that this mass number has to be conserved, so the 40 that you see on the left must be reflected on the right as well. So we set this up as a simple little algebraic expression. 40 equals 0 plus x, so our x has to be 40. So the top number is 40. Do the same process on the bottom to figure out the nuclear charge. 19 equals negative 1 from the electron plus what? Well, we're going to be adding a negative 1, so this number has to be uh, 20. 20 plus negative 1 will give us 19. So we're looking for a particle that has a mass of 40, nuclear charge of 20, and you go to your periodic table, find out what element 20 is, and you'll get the answer, calcium. So your missing piece is a calcium 40 over 20. Question 64. Determine the fraction of an original sample of K42 that remains unchanged after 24.72 hours. One thing we need to know before we can do this problem is what is the half-life of K42? You look this up on table N and you'll find that it's 12.36 hours. In other words, this sample will be cut in half every 12.36 hours. So if you start with a whole mass, let's call it 1, at no half-lives gone by, you have a full mass. After one half-life, you're reduced to one half of the original. Two half-lives take you to a quarter, three to an eighth, four to a sixteenth, and so on. So in the course of 24.72 hours, how many half-lives have gone by? If we divide the 24.72 hours by the half-life, 12.36, we see that we have experienced two half-lives. Two half-lives will reduce you to one quarter of the original sample. The answer to this question is one quarter remaining. And finally, question 65. Show a numerical setup for calculating the atomic mass of potassium. This is a weighted average problem. You're only asked to show the numerical setup, so don't worry about actually calculating this. But the details of the setup are a little bit confusing sometimes. There are three isotopes involved here, so our calculation is going to have three parts to it. And what we have to do is we have to multiply the atomic mass values of each isotope, 38.96, by the relative abundance. But these are percentages, so make sure you do something to move the decimal two places. You can either write it as is, then divide the whole thing by 100, or you could just move the decimal to start with. That's what I'll do. So it's 0.9326. So 38.96 times 0.9326 plus 39.96 times, be careful here, 0 0.0001 and then 40.96 times 0 0.0673. So just be careful with the percentages being converted to decimal equivalents. Make sure you don't lose track of where the decimals go. That's the finished answer. You don't have to calculate it. They only wanted the numerical setup. And that concludes Part B2 on the June 2015 Chemistry Regents exam. Look for additional videos for Parts A, B1, and C of this exam. Thanks for watching. You can access additional videos and materials for this and other chemistry exams at alchemtutor.com. For questions, comments, or permissions, please contact me at my email address at asnyder at alchemtutor.com. And if you have interest in contracting tutorial services, you can also contact me through the website at alchemtutor.com.